I still struggle to comprehend how some individuals possess such unwavering confidence in themselves, allowing them to pursue their desires without hesitation. A close friend once branded such people as fools, predicting that they would eventually face consequences for their arrogance. Initially, I found myself in agreement, yet I unwittingly hastened the reckoning for my own betrayer, the cursed jacket. My 18-wheeler stood fully loaded, poised for its 750-mile journey, while my jacket hung forgotten in the closet, snug in the confines of my home. Despite the supervisor's evident displeasure, he granted me a brief respite to retrieve it. Curses slipped from my lips as the trailer's wheels scraped against the curb during the final turn into my narrow street. With a hiss of brakes, I brought the truck to a halt before my house, puzzled by an unfamiliar sight. There, parked in my driveway, sat the boss's car, its engine idling ominously. Rushing through the front door and down the hallway, I reached the bedroom shared with my wife. Swinging the door open, light flooded the room, exposing a scene of betrayal, my wife, oblivious on all fours, while my boss, caught in the act, glanced up guiltily before resuming his actions with a smirk. With trembling hands, I retrieved my abandoned jacket from the wardrobe, consumed by a raging fury. Shouting at them in anger, I stormed out, slamming doors in my wake. As I climbed into the cab of the Kenworth truck and merged onto the freeway, the fire of indignation continued to burn fiercely within me. Despite the chaos, I managed to wrestle back control of my emotions. However, a nagging doubt about returning home lingered in my mind, leaving me lost in thought. Suddenly, the truck hit a bump, jolting me off the road toward a menacing tree trunk. That's the last thing I recall. I believe he's regaining consciousness, remarked a distant female voice. I struggled in vain to open my eyes, my limbs immobile and sensation absent from my legs. Then, another voice, unmistakably my wife's, murmured, Charlotte's awake, thank heavens. Additional voices chimed in, and I felt hands touching my face. Good morning, Mr. Lewis. It's good to see you awake again. How are you feeling? Asked a commanding male voice. Though I attempted to speak, words failed to form. After a tremendous effort, I managed to pry my eyes open. The room was brightly illuminated and I discerned several figures moving about, though they appeared blurred. Mr. Lewis, blink if you can hear me, the male voice boomed. I blinked. Excellent, he continued. You've been in an accident and are currently in a hospital. Please refrain from attempting to move. You've sustained multiple fractures and we've kept you in an induced coma for 13 days while we work to stabilize you. Do you understand? Yeah, I understand, I thought. Blinking once more, I signaled my acknowledgement. Now we need to focus on your recovery, the voice continued. It'll be a gradual process, but we'll get you back on your feet. Overwhelmed by exhaustion and drowsiness, I closed my eyes and drifted back into the realm of dreams. Upon reopening my eyes, the passage of time remained uncertain. My vision cleared, and I observed various tubes connected to my body. Despite this, I managed to turn my head slightly and caught a presence beside me. Seated in a corner chair, my wife was absorbed in a book until she sensed my movement. Hastily abandoning her reading, she rushed to my bedside. Henry, she began, relief palpable in her voice. I'm relieved to see you awake. I feared we had lost you. How are you feeling? The question felt weighty after weeks in a coma. How could I possibly articulate my state? Before I could respond, I realized I still couldn't speak. She tenderly touched my forehead before retreating to her seat, her expression a tumult of emotions. I couldn't quite decipher it. Was it compassion, anger, sympathy, guilt? Holding her gaze until she looked away only confirmed my suspicion of guilt. I struggled to piece together my thoughts, memories of the accident flashing through my mind. Why had I left the house in such haste? The effort proved overwhelming, and I succumbed to unconsciousness once more, undoubtedly aided by medication dulling my senses. When I next awoke, darkness had settled in the room, and the chair had been replaced by a makeshift cot. Charlotte lay asleep, wrapped in a thin hospital blanket. As my thoughts wandered, the gradually coalesced, recollections flooding back, picking up my truck from the depot. 
Rushing into my bedroom, I was met with the sight of my wife entangled with my company boss. Suddenly, everything clicked into place. I attempted to speak to accuse them both. You traitor, I wanted to shout. But what emerged from my lips was barely a whisper, enough to rouse Charlotte, who hurried to my side from her cot. I instinctively recoiled as she reached for my face, attempting to turn away. I hoped my eyes conveyed the rage that had been brewing for days. I remained heavily medicated to manage the pain from my fractured legs and an unexamined back injury. My truck was wrecked, but luckily, a trailing car promptly reported the accident and an ambulance arrived swiftly. Doctors began outlining the extent of my injuries and the rehabilitation plan ahead. Amidst it all, my deceitful wife, Charlotte, remained a constant presence in my room. Eventually, my ability to speak returned. What shall I say to my wife, who was also a member of the nursing staff? Seizing a rare moment when Charlotte slipped out to use the bathroom, the nurse remarked that she had never seen a more devoted wife. Charlotte had been by my side since shortly after my admission, steadfastly refusing to leave. I chose not to disillusion her. Once Charlotte returned and the nurse had departed, I resolved to seek some answers. How long? I asked Charlotte, catching her off guard. They suspect you fell asleep at the wheel, she ventured cautiously. They anticipate your recovery will take several months. That's not by masking, I retorted. And you know it? I certainly didn't fall asleep at the wheel, but something caused my truck to swerve off the road. Now, what about you and my boss? How long have you been having an affair behind my back? Henry, I really don't want to discuss him right now. I love you, and only you. I am fully dedicated to helping you recuperate from this terrible accident, Charlotte pleaded, her voice trembling with emotion. Well, you may consider me ungrateful for saying so. But the last time I saw the two of you, it certainly didn't seem like you were in love with me. Upon reflection, it also occurs to me that this wasn't the first time you two were together, correct? I pressed, my tone heavy with accusation. She didn't need to respond. The guilt was evident in her expression as she cast her eyes downward, avoiding my gaze. So my unfaithful Charlotte, how long? I began, but she interrupted, desperation evident in her voice. Henry, I really don't want to discuss it. Do you want a divorce then? Oh God, no Henry, please trust me when I say I love you, and only you. I want to have your children. I want to grow old with you, she pleaded. That seems unlikely, I retorted bitterly. Now Charlotte, you betrayed our wedding vows. Remember when we promised to be faithful to each other till death do us part. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you by surviving the crash. But it appears you couldn't wait for my demise. Anyway, so the prospect of us living together happily ever after seems rather slim, would you agree? She recoiled from my harsh words and sank into her chair, tears streaming down her face as she covered her face with her hands, crying softly. I think you should go home, Charlotte, I said, my voice heavy with sorrow. You might find me ungrateful for not appreciating your loyalty, but whenever I see you all, I can only envision my boss violating you. She cried louder, grabbed a small overnight bag, and stumbled out of my room into the hospital corridor, leaving me alone and feeling wretched. A passing nurse noticed her absence and commented on it, but I chose not to respond. Instead, I asked her to inform my supervisor at work that I was able to receive visitors. Less than an hour later, he showed up, expressing his relief at seeing me alive after the accident. I saw the truck, Henry, you're one lucky guy. I can't believe you made it out of there alive, Logan remarked. Yeah, well, thanks for coming, Logan. I've been replaying the accident in my mind for the past few days. I replied, my thoughts still consumed by the events. Even though my memory of it is a bit blurry, something broke on that truck. It was out of control. Logan, the steering wheel was ripped out of my hands, and the whole rig just veered off the road after hitting a bump. Has the truck been inspected yet? I inquired. Nah, word is you fell asleep, Logan responded, his expression grave. Logan, could you go talk to the workshop supervisor? Please ask him to examine the wreckage. 
and see if he can find anything that might have caused me to swerve off the road I requested. I could sense Logan's skepticism, but he agreed to speak with the workshop supervisor. As we chatted about various topics, Logan finally broached the main issue. I thought Charlotte might have been with you. Has she been around? He asked cautiously. She just left. Why do you ask? I inquired. No particular reason, Henry. I just assumed she'd be here. That's all, Logan replied, shifting uncomfortably on his feet before making his excuses and leaving. It struck me that Charlotte's affair with the boss might not be as discreet as she thought. The next day, I was visited by two colleagues. One was Elliot Harris, the workshop foreman, and accompanying him was the union representative, a stern man named Larry McTaylor. Neither seemed pleased. Mac took charge. Henry, we've encountered an issue. I brought Elliot along to explain, but your accident was inevitable, and I've already initiated the process to inspect and clear every tractor in the entire fleet before its next operation. Management is furious because numerous deliveries will be delayed, and some customers have already threatened to switch carriers if we fail them, Mac explained solemnly. Take a look at the workshop log for your rig, Henry, Elliot said, handing over the oily hardcover log book for the tractor I had damaged. On the last page, filled out, was a highlighted note about a broken spring on the front axle. Turn back to the previous page, Elliot instructed. Turning the page, amidst discussions of uneven tire wear, I found an almost identical note about a broken spring leaf. Flipping back further, I observed that the broken spring had been mentioned each time the truck underwent servicing. Damn it, Elliot, why didn't you replace it? I exclaimed, Management wouldn't allow me to hold up the truck. I had a replacement ready in the workshop 2.5 weeks ago, but they refused to let me take the rig off the road because they were too busy. They kept saying it would be fixed at the next service, Elliot explained. And nobody thought to inform me about this, I questioned. I'm sorry, Henry. The boss was convinced it was a minor issue, so it didn't occur to me until the accident. I'm truly sorry. It's my fault that you're injured, Elliot apologized. Rubbish, muttered Mac. They knew the risk and gambled with your life. Today, I reached out to our legal team, and they've assigned Jack Brown to handle your case. He's already obtained the logbook entries and statements from other drivers. This guy's a real fighter, Henry. We need to tackle this on two fronts, getting you compensated for medical bills, rehab, and lost wages, and securing a package for the likelihood that you won't be able to drive professionally again due to your back injury. Mac's direct words shook me. I hadn't even considered the possibility of not returning to work. As I lay back in bed, closing my eyes, Mac reassured me, don't worry, Henry. Focus on getting better and moving forward. We've got your back. I watched them leave my hospital room, a tear sipping down my cheek. Feeling disheartened seemed justified after everything I'd been through in a matter of weeks. Crashing my truck, being in a coma, and now facing the reality of losing not only my wife, but also my job. The next day, Jack Brown entered my room with energy. An imposing presence, likely in his early 40s, he stood well over six feet tall with a physique that suggested he could be a professional basketball player. We went over the crash workshop reports and then discussed future options. You started three years of a business degree, he remarked. What made you abandon that and switch to truck driving for a living? I grinned. My father was a long-haul truck driver and often took me along during my school years. So it wasn't as drastic a change as it might seem to you. There's another reason. I met a wonderful girl and we couldn't wait to get married. And no, she wasn't pregnant. We were just deeply in love. And changing careers allowed us to be together. That's a touching story, Henry, but I've heard rumors that things might not be going well between you two, Jack remarked, his incredulity evident. Dan, am I the last person in the state to find out? Your wife was cheating with my boss, with your boss, he echoed. I look forward to tearing him apart in court. I don't really care about him anymore, but I need you to start preparing divorce papers as soon as possible. We don't typically handle divorces, but I'm willing to make an exception. In this case, Jack was exceptional. 
During our brief time together, I grew to trust him deeply. He exuded compassion, energy, and a strong sense of integrity, which brought me hope and solace. He meticulously outlined his strategy for my legal action against my employers and assured me of expert advice regarding my separation from Charlotte. For the first time since the accident, a glimmer of optimism crept into my psyche. Days passed as I commenced recovery therapy and underwent medical examinations, including C80 scans, to devise a treatment plan for my aching back. Then, an unexpected visitor entered my room, requesting confirmation of my identity. Immediately, I became vigilant. He handed me a small envelope, seemingly poised to request a signature, before noticing the array of tubes attached to me, prompting him to retreat quietly. Good day, sir, he muttered as he exited the room, disappearing into anonymity. I summoned a nurse to open the envelope and relay its contents to me. She complied but turned pale upon reading. It's a termination notice from your company, she whispered. How could they do this to you while you were still hospitalized? I asked her to call Jack on my behalf and read him the letter. As expected, he arrived at my side within minutes, seething with anger over the callousness. This letter will cost this jerk dearly, he vowed. It essentially obviates the need for us to argue in court about your ability to continue your chosen career. He settled it for us. His cold and calculated treatment of an employee in the hospital, recovering from a work-related injury, won't earn him any favors either, Jack continued. Or began a typical day on the road to recovery shifted from hopelessness to optimism. Jack had a knack for instilling positivity about the future in me. Oh, and by the way, he added as he was leaving, your wife was served with divorce papers today. Charlotte hadn't visited since she left in tears, but she entered my room just after dinner, visibly furious. How could you do this to me, she cried. I didn't want a divorce. I made a mistake, Henry, a mistake, but I love you. And I want us to stay together and work it out. I face her in this confrontation much more prepared. Charlotte, your way of expressing love is peculiar. It was distressing enough to witness firsthand the damage you've inflicted on our marriage. Yet it appears I was the last to know what was truly happening. It's evident now that every time I embarked on a long journey, it signaled another rendezvous with my boss. I previously inquired about the extent of your affair, and you evaded the question. But it's irrelevant now, Charlotte. You've repeatedly disrespected me and our marriage vows. Have I ever denied you, Henry? Is that your defense? She asked incredulously. Honestly, Charlotte, I expected better from you. How many times have you two been together since my accident? She averted her gaze and fell silent. I wondered if her silence meant they hadn't been together at all. Could there still be hope? We've had a solid marriage until now. Let's not tarnish our good memories with anger and deceit. We'll have to discuss the division of assets eventually. But now is the time. Go home, Charlotte. If he brings you happiness, file for divorce and be with him. But don't expect me to be your life partner anymore. I can't look at you without reliving the moment I caught you with him. There's no way to move past that. Goodbye, Charlotte. I wish you a happy life. Once more, she left my hospital room in tears. This time, I hoped it was for the last time. Initially, my limbs recovered. I maneuvered around the ward with plaster casts, undergoing multiple therapy sessions daily. However, my back injury was severe, necessitating stabilization with metal plates to fuse several vertebrae. A delicate surgery lasting hours. Subsequent recovery proved grueling, marked by persistent pain until my eventual discharge, relying on a regimen of painkillers. Meanwhile, Jack Brown pursued legal action aggressively against the transport company, exploring every legal avenue. Despite initial hopes for a pretrial settlement, I found myself in court as Jack presented his case to a judge. By day's end, witness testimonies overwhelmingly favored Jack, undermining the company's defense. Before the second day began, the company's solicitors sought to settle out of court. I'm aiming for maximum impact, Jack exclaimed, as we entered the negotiation room. They've lost, and they know it. Now they're just trying to limit the fallout. In keeping with his promise, Jack issued a challenge, 
insisting on a minimum of $9.5 million in damages and compensation. He emphasized my ongoing medical expenses, enduring back pain, and the uncertainty of retraining for a new career. Surprisingly, even I found myself sympathizing with my own plight. The negotiation had to be finalized before the court reconvened at 10.30 a.m., which worked in our favor. When the defense offered $4.7 million, Jack outwardly scold, concealing a triumphant gotcha. Knowing we'd likely settle halfway between his initial demand of $9.5 million and their offer. Ultimately, he prevailed relentlessly, pushing them until both parties agreed on $7.3 million. I breathed a sigh of relief with my boss. Since, well, before the accident, I observed with a certain satisfaction his visible anger at being coerced into this situation, as well as his inability to meet my gaze. With the legal matters resolved, I made one last trip to the depot to bid farewell to my colleagues. Elliot, whose meticulous records had highlighted the company's negligence, and Larry, who had advocated tirelessly for my fair treatment. It was time for me to regroup and plan for the future. I made the decision to relocate to my parents' hometown, where I had previously studied, to resume my education. Hoping to secure an administrative position, I purchased a two-bedroom apartment near the university and a small hatchback for transportation. Returning to academia was an intriguing experience. I found myself a decade older than most of my peers in the group, but also significantly more motivated. Success became a genuine aspiration, and my parents were thrilled with the new arrangement. I made it a point to visit them every weekend, whether it was taking my dad to football games or occasionally fishing in the bay. We regularly enjoyed meals together at restaurants. Although Charlotte hadn't signed the divorce papers, she appeared to be handling the mortgage and utilities. So I decided not to push the issue, preferring to avoid conflict in my life. Following Jack Brown's advice, I allowed him to arrange for a security agency to install several security cameras in our house until our divorce was finalized. He believed it prudent to monitor the premises without needing to physically check in. A couple of years later, I graduated with honors. The search for a stable, long-term job led me to an accounting firm in the city center, specializing in corporate bankruptcy management. Their approach was largely innovative. Instead of immediately resorting to bankruptcy, their primary goal was to assess operations and attempt to restore profitability, sometimes involving sacrifices from creditors. I found my work fulfilling as part of a small team of seasoned professionals, conducting forensic examinations of various companies to identify shortcomings and collaborate with key personnel to devise turnaround strategies. It didn't take long for my knack for pinpointing corporate weaknesses and devising effective solutions to be recognized. Both the partners and my colleagues acknowledged my contributions, and I was entrusted with leading my own team along with a significant salary increase. When a new task arrived at my desk one morning, I was taken aback. The company in financial distress was none other than my former employer, recognizing the potential conflict of interest. I promptly called a senior partner and requested to be excused from the case. His response was direct. Henry, we understand your prior connection with this company, which actually makes you the ideal candidate. Surely, you still have former colleagues dependent on the business for their livelihoods, providing you with an additional incentive to help them out of this situation. Moreover, I have faith in your professionalism. My first task was to inform my old boss that our firm had been appointed and that I would be leading the management team. He went on about the perceived injustice of it, claiming there was no significant issue, just a minor cash flow hiccup that had already been resolved and that our involvement would be a complete waste of time. I politely mentioned that the intervention had been mandated by the courts and that our team had been tasked with conducting the investigation. I informed him that we would be arriving with my team at 8.45 the following morning, expressing gratitude in advance for his cooperation, and then ended the call. It became immediately apparent upon our arrival that the staff had been instructed to provide as little information as possible, consistently hindering our progress. This response from management was not unexpected to us. We represented their failure to effectively manage their own business. In the morning, I briefly discussed matters with Larry and Elliot over coffee and following a group discussion with my team. At lunchtime, 
I reached a decision. I knocked on the boss's door, entered, and suggested that it might be less awkward if he vacated the premises, allowing my team to proceed with our work. Initially, he outright rejected the idea, but upon realizing that I could request his removal by force, he reluctantly acquiesced and left like a disgruntled child. It took me three days to identify the issue. A young member of our team, a petted blonde with pigtails who appeared no older than 18 and had just graduated from a commercial school, approached me with a ledger from a creditor. The inquiry came regarding a driver employed by the company who regularly received payments for long distance trips across the state. However, upon inspection, the same truck wasn't listed on any of the freight manifests. So the question arose, what exactly was it being used for and who was footing the bill? She expressed gratitude for her keen observation skills as I requested copies of the invoices. The phenomenon of phantom operators is a classic tactic among transportation companies that utilize subcontracted vehicles. It's typically uncovered when a member of the accounting team never takes time off, diligently attempting to conceal their actions. However, this wasn't the case here. Upon reviewing the invoices, it became evident that every single one had been approved by the boss himself. Summoning the administration manager, I inquired whether the company had provided the boss with a laptop. Absolutely, he replied with enthusiasm. We purchased four Dell laptops approximately a year ago, and the boss has the highest end model among them. I can provide the invoice if you'd like to see it internally. I grinned and made a mental note of the boss's computer's serial number. My next step was to contact the local sheriff for assistance. I needed to retrieve a company device from a manager's house, and I suspected he wouldn't willingly surrender it. I explained to the sheriff that the laptop likely holds crucial information for our investigation into his company, though not overly eager. He agreed to pick me up from the depot office in 25 minutes. During our drive, he began questioning me. You used to work for this organization, right? He asked. Yes, I confirmed. Remember that nasty accident you had to handle the wreckage recovery? You were lucky to make it out alive, son. Yes, indeed. But things tend to work out in the end, I replied. You left your wife when you moved out, he continued. That's correct, I responded thoughtfully. Is that guy still involved with her? He inquired. I wouldn't know, Sheriff. I filed for divorce upon leaving. It's not finalized, but I have no romantic attachments at the moment. And frankly, I don't care who she's with, I explained. I think she spends her nights alone. He visits during the day. He's married with kids and returns home every night. His wife is probably the only one unaware of what's happening, the sheriff remarked. Well, that makes two of us, I retorted bitterly. I had no clue either until I stumbled upon them in the act. That was the day of the accident. We had agreed that the sheriff would allow me to request the laptop and intervene only if necessary, which unsurprisingly it was. Initially, he attempted to pass off an older, different make laptop, but upon realizing I had the make and serial number of the unit, we were seeking and seeing the sheriff approach from the squad car. He reluctantly surrendered it, assuring me it would be returned to him within 24 hours, anticipating he might be correct. After the sheriff dropped me back at the office, I gathered my team. One member was tasked with immediately downloading the entire laptop contents onto our security server. This precaution would enable us to comply with any court order for its return, while also maintaining a hidden auto-forward function to monitor any subsequent activity. As expected, a young lawyer, liking new to the profession, arrived to demand the laptop's immediate return. Initially, we argued that the laptop belonged to the company, not his client, but ultimately conceded that he had the authority to take possession. The laptop had been carefully returned to its case before the lawyer's arrival, giving the impression it hadn't been tampered with by myself or my team. The lawyer, with a sense of victory, eagerly took possession and skipped back to his car. Meanwhile, my IT team was examining the contents downloaded from the laptop. Their task was significantly simplified by the scarcity of passwords and the surprisingly easy access to all areas. We focused on bank records and uncovered a series of transactions spanning several years, progressively increasing in both amount and frequency. 
it became evident that our target was diverting substantial sums of money through fraudulent invoices, which passed through the system because of his approval. Our next objective was to trace the money trail. Initially, payments were directed to a bank account under the guise of a phantom contractor, naturally controlled by the company's boss. The account maintained only a nominal balance, indicating funds were being redirected elsewhere to evade detection. By deciphering codes from the downloaded files, we managed to uncover some of the accounts where money had been concealed. These accounts were dispersed across various countries under different names. It was time to enlist the expertise of Jack Brown, the lawyer who successfully handled my compensation case. He was still with the same firm and had been promoted to partner since our last encounter. He appeared pleased to see me and was eagerly anticipating the opportunity to pursue legal action against my former boss. After days of intense meetings with regulatory authorities and law enforcement agencies, we concluded that it was necessary for the police to immediately press charges of embezzlement and to seek immediate incarceration without bail to prevent the defendant from fleeing the country. On the day James Murphy was arrested, I received a visitor at the transportation company office. Henry, there's a Mrs. Murphy waiting for you at the reception desk, the young receptionist informed me. All right, send her in. I anticipated that this encounter would be intriguing. The woman who entered my temporary office, in fact, the boss's office, which I had taken over in his absence, was stunning. She was blonde, well-built, impeccably dressed and exuded elegance, extending her hand for a handshake. She sat gracefully in a visitor's chair opposite my desk. After a surprisingly firm grip, she spoke, Mr. Lewis, I am James Murphy's spouse. Yes, I had gathered as much. How may I assist you, Mrs. Murphy? I am aware that you played a role in my husband's imprisonment. That may be overstating it, Mrs. Murphy. We have evidence indicating that your husband unlawfully diverted significant sums of money from his own company, jeopardizing its future due to the risk of flight. He has been detained pending trial. So effectively, Mrs. Murphy, it is your husband's actions that have led to his imprisonment, not mine. What knowledge do you have about the company's ownership? Mr. Lewis, only what is documented in the corporate records. There are two shares held individually by you and your husband, but you are already aware of this. Why do you ask, Mr. Lewis? I believe if I were to mention my maiden name, you would immediately recognize my family. We were early investors in this company and have heavily financed its growth, primarily through loans secured by my family. Although there are two shares, as you mentioned, the entirety of the company's funding has been provided by my family. If the company fails, my husband stands to lose one share that was initially given to him. He demonstrated competence in managing the company during its early stages, and I still have faith in his abilities. The situation was becoming increasingly complicated. Upon our initial examination of the company's structure, we noted a significant number of loans originating from a single investor, but we had not yet linked this to Murphy's wife, Mrs. Murphy. I sigh without intending any disrespect to your husband. Our investigations suggest that he has not been entirely honest with you. This will be taken into account by the court. In the upcoming weeks, we've already taken legal action to prevent him from accessing any part of the company's affairs. Additionally, we've reassured the staff that the organization is likely to trade its way out of its financial difficulties. Our findings indicate that it should be operating profitably and its current precarious state is the result of illicit activities, details of which I cannot disclose. However, I assure you that we won't leave until we're confident in securing its future or if necessary, liquidating its assets. The refined lady nodded, rose from her seat, thanked me and gracefully exited the office, leaving a hint of her perfume lingering in the air. By the time the court convened, we had all the necessary evidence lined up. We not only understood how Murphy had moved funds using a fictitious contractor, but also precisely where and when those funds were transferred. However, his motives remained a mystery, as none of the embezzled funds seemed to have been spent in the courtroom. Our lawyer, Jack Brown, systematically dismantled Murphy's defense. Initially, Murphy attempted to evade direct questions evidently unaware of the extent of our gathered information. What he didn't know was that Jack Brown had security cameras in place 
a detail he hadn't mentioned since their installation. When Murphy was brought back to the witness stand, he struggled to respond to a barrage of financial inquiries before Brown abruptly changed direction. Mr. Murphy, he began innocently, are you acquainted with a Mrs. Charlotte Lewis? Yes, he replied visibly pale. Could you please elaborate on your relationship with Mrs. Lewis? Certainly, he said, she is the spouse of one of my former drivers. We would occasionally meet at company gatherings. Is there anything else you wish to disclose about your association with Mrs. Lewis? Feeling unsettled and increasingly frustrated by Jack Brown's probing, he replied, I have no personal relationship with Mrs. Lewis. As I mentioned, she is the wife of a former employee who is currently involved in investigating my company. Have you ever engaged in sexual activity with Mrs. Lewis? Absolutely not, he responded immediately. Your Honor, I request to release this witness for a potential recall later and call Mr. Adam Thompson to the stand. Permission was granted. A burly individual, approximately 39 years old and carrying a bit more weight than advisable, casually approached the witness stand and was duly sworn in. Mr. Thompson, could you please state your full name and occupation for the court? Adam James Thompson, and I work as a security consultant. Could you please inform the court of the task I assigned you on May 17, two years ago? I was tasked with installing five security cameras in the residence owned by Mr. and Mrs. Henry Lewis. Are these cameras still operational, Mr. Thompson? Yes, sir. Their footage is automatically transferred to our servers every 24 hours. Who is responsible for monitoring these surveillance recordings? Mr. Thompson, up until yesterday, when you requested to see them, nobody had reviewed them with the court's permission. I'd like to present five photographs. May I proceed? The judge nodded, granting approval, and Bram theatrically handed the first photo to the witness, who examined it with a stoic expression. Could you identify the individuals in this photograph? And if possible, the location where it was taken? Certainly. The man in the photo is the defendant, James Murphy. I'm not familiar with the woman in the photo, but she is seated in the gallery. He pointed out Charlotte, who was attempting to shrink into her seat. Could you describe to the court what the individuals in the photograph were doing at the time? Well, they were engaged in sexual activity, sexual intercourse, yes sir, your honor. I have four additional photographs taken at separate times over recent weeks from the security cameras in the home, which I'd like to submit to the court. As evidence, I also possess an affidavit from Mr. Thompson, affirming the authenticity of the photos and the placement of the security cameras, your honor. I would like to request that Mr. Murphy be recalled to the stand. The individual appeared visibly shaken. He acknowledged the severity of the situation, averting his gaze to the floor as further questions were posed, eventually conceding to committing penjury. Once the proceedings with Murphy concluded, the court adjourned until the following day. Upon reconvening, the judge swiftly addressed the matter, finding Murphy guilty of embezzlement, amounting to millions of dollars, as well as perjury. The judge also made note of the potential charges related to Murphy's inappropriate relationship with an employee's spouse. Sentencing was postponed for several weeks, leaving us content with the outcome of our efforts. With information obtained regarding overseas financial institutions and account details, the majority of the funds were recoverable. Meeting with Logan, Elliot, Larry, and other senior staff at the transport terminal, was a genuine pleasure as we assured them that the missing funds had been located, outstanding debts settled, and the courts had granted permission for normal trading activities to resume. Logan was poised to assume the CEO position, and with the support of his dedicated team, the company was expected to thrive. Once again, ownership now firmly rested with Murphy's wife, who had proven to be a steadfast supporter during their hardships. A few days later, during a dinner with Jack Brown, Charlotte approached our table. I rose to greet her and extended an invitation to join us. Since we had just placed our orders, I promptly signaled a waiter to take Charlotte's drink and meal preferences. She appeared visibly uncomfortable in our company, and Jack Brown also didn't seem thrilled about her presence. I apologize for intruding on your privacy like this, she started. But when I found out that you had made dinner reservations here, 
I realized that it was long overdue for us to have a conversation. So here I am. What's on my mind, Charlotte? By now, you must know that James and I had plans to leave the country together and start a new life abroad. James kept hinting that he would soon have the means to support our life together. But he never disclosed how. I was stunned when the company went bankrupt, as I believed it was thriving. And I was even more shocked in court to learn that my partner, sorry Henry, but he's been my partner for many years, was planning to fund our life together while embezzling from his own company. This isn't really the appropriate time or place for us to have this conversation, I began, indicating discomfort at Jack Brown. Perhaps we could discuss this another time. No need for a conversation, Henry, Charlotte interjected. I was foolish to discard your love so recklessly, and even more foolish to think our relationship was serious when I knew all along that James was still involved with his wife. I doubt I was ever more than a secret affair in his mind. When we first started seeing each other while you were out of town, but gradually I let myself believe I was in love with him. Clearly, judging by the amount of money he managed to hide over the past few years, he must have felt something for me too. But that's not why I'm here. Digging through her purse, she extracted a crumpled piece of paper. Here's the divorce petition, Henry, signed without any strings attached. You're officially rid of me. We'll need to discuss the house, but I won't be making any further claims considering I'm the one who wrecked our relationship in the first place. Thanks for the dinner invitation, but suddenly I've lost my appetite. Good night. With that, she rose hastily, attempting to conceal the tears welling up, and hurried away. Well, that was unexpected, I remarked with a smile to Jack Brown. Now, perhaps we can enjoy our dinner. About a month later, the court reconvened for the sentencing hearing, so Jack Brown and I opted to attend. To our surprise, Charlotte was also in the gallery, dressed conservatively in a business suit and looking stunning. The sentencing was brief. The judge recited the charges, handing down extensive jail time for each offence. The total amounted to over 15 years, but with time served, Murphy would be eligible for parole in eight years and six months. As he glanced up and caught my eye, observing the relief on my face, he mouthed something that might have been screw you, but I was content. The conniving man who stole my wife while I toiled away driving trucks across the country was finally facing consequences. In the span of three months, he lost his hidden wealth, his wife, his business and his mistress. As he was escorted away to begin his sentence, I flashed him my most cheerful smile. Only then did I notice Murphy's soon-to-be ex-wife in the gallery. She smiled at me as we crossed paths near the exit, heading out. Care to join you for lunch? She offered, following a couple of steps behind her. I could hear every word while my ex-wife, Charlotte, stood nearby. I'd love to, I replied with a smile. Charlotte sputtered in disbelief and quickly averted her gaze. The woman took my arm as I offered it and we leisurely walked to a tranquil restaurant close to the courthouse. Friends, write your opinion about this story in the comments. Have a great day.